Go. Sweat Equity Podcast, the number one comedy business podcast in the world. I want money. I want money. Pragmatic entrepreneurial advice with real raw dog talk. Well, you had to pump the brakes on this one, actually. You, you stopped yourself from saying I it. Did. I did. I heard, I heard you laugh with our guest. He's snickering. Mary Ann Perrett. You can, if, that's a little Easter egg if you make it all the way at the end of the episode. Um, what, what's the award we just won? We just won another award, right? Oh, yeah. I We're forgot. the best small business advice podcast in the goddamn universe. Yeah, that's it. Uh, something, something like that. It's something like that. It's definitely a, a scam award, but we're taking it. Uh, listen to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, OnlyFans, Substack, YouTube, uh, Google Play, Google, uh, the Amazon Podcasts, um, iHeartRadio. Yeah. We're on all those things. And if we're not on something we need to get on, let us know. Uh, this episode brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one drag-and-drop, no coding necessary website developer and designer. Make a website on your own. You don't need code. You don't need a lot of nerds that are going to rip you off. You don't even need one nerd. The, the, the support on Squarespace, if you need to know something, is actually helpful. It's weird. Yeah, it's weird. It's not like just some bot, chat bot talking to you, like Verizon mm-hmm. or your cable company. Uh, Squarespace, uh, get get a little hookup. Holler if you hear me. Uh, hit the link in our uh, episode description if you want a little discount. It hooks the show up. We like that, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. we do. We do. I want money. Then we can have our Schmitz gay pool party once we get enough of that ad Give money me coming money. in. Yeah. Let's get it started with Marianne Pruitt in Alaska. Howdy Donnie! What about my sweat equity? Sweat equity. Sweat, 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 sweat equity. My sweat equity. My, my, my sweat equity. Of Alaska? I'm in Anchorage. I'm in Anchorage. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How many? Uh, what's We're good. We're what, good. What's population size of Anchorage? Anchorage we, is about almost four hundred thousand. We're the majority of the state. And that's the biggest city, right? It is. Yeah. Right, root, population statewide is a little over seven hundred thousand. I had a college roommate from Juneau. Um, okay. Which is odd because it was I went to Auburn. Um, so he made it to Something Middle East. Standout student. Middle East, okay. Alabama. Or the Harvard of Middle East, Alabama. Well, uh, at least you're, you're somewhere up there in Middle East, Alabama. It works. <laughs> but yeah, Southeast Juno. Juno is the only capital in the United States that you have to fly to or take a boat to. You can't drive. Huh. Oh, you can't. It's, it's, it's an island? Drive. If I was trying to go. It's not an island. It is not an island, but you have to take a boat. There is no road to Juno. Oh. oh, really? I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. He never mentioned yeah. that, my old roommate. See? You have to fly or take a boat. It's the only way to get there. Tal Blair, my old roommate, didn't tell me a whole lot about Alaska. Okay. He probably told you all You're about it. You're going to learn more today attention. about Alaska than you did then. Well, so, w- yeah. w- when we were roommates, we did have one of those uh, big uh, peace pipe, communal pipes that you can <laughs> smoke tobacco out of. So, tobacco? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, so... Or six, weed. Six packs of soda. <laughs> right, there. right. The the Tommy boy. Um, yeah. We're we're rolling and we're keeping that all in. All of that stuff. Go for it. Uh, Go for it. Mary Ann Pruitt. Uh, why don't you give everybody your plugs? Where to find you? If you're promoting anything yep. in particular, so we don't mess it up. Yeah, Mary Ann Pruitt. I'm with Mosaic Media. We are a collaboration of. Media's finest when it comes to negotiating and putting together your paid media plans. If it falls under that umbrella, that is us. You can find me on Twitter at Media Maps. And you can also, if any point, anybody just wants us to talk about media or has questions after we go through this interview, they can always reach out to me at mosaic.agency forward slash contact and it comes straight to me. I'm always about having a conversation and helping people with their media plans and even auditing and looking at what you currently have. Yeah. We, uh, you know, Eric and I are kind of cut from the same cloth. I feel like we'll, we'll kind of try to help anybody. Um, because, yep. because there's so much, uh, I'll, I'll classify it under digital, but there's so much just, um, snake oil hearsay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And yes. you're, you're out of Alaska doing all this work. 
Yeah, so I live in Alaska. We have uh, teams and offices in the Pacific Northwest, in the South, so um, and Midwest, as well as East Coast. So we cover all 50 states. Um, I just happen to have founded and live in Alaska. So founded the company in Alaska and live in Alaska, but now less than 5% of our work is in Alaska. It just happens to be my home. Yeah, I want to ask you about uh, the remote workforce uh, kind of mm-hmm. foundation you set up. But first, I want to ask our question we ask every guest the first time they come on. What advice would you give your uh, 13-year-old self? 13-year-old self is don't hesitate and go for the things that you want to go for. Um, don't, I think, and I, I maybe this is for me, uh, coming from a young entrepreneur and a female young entrepreneur is don't second guess yourself, know your gut. And I think that's every entrepreneur. We all have to look at it as your gut will tell you a story and follow that um, and listen to that gut. And it's okay to check that every once in a while. Props on the uh, quickness for don't hesitate. You really lived yeah. it out. Well, bam! Don't I have- can tell she's good at what she does because a lot of this work, a lot of your work is planning. Um, yeah, and it seems like you prepared for this interview what? by listening. And not to, as much as you would think. But I, I, I like I like too. little like impromptu. <laughs> I I love impromptu. I do have a little background knowledge of me. There's a little theater that I had in the background, so I think a little impromptu is always good. Yeah, I can tell you're very present, but also uh, uh, before the mics heated up, we uh, you said you listened to a couple episodes, which is unusual for most Still of our guests. on the show. <laughs> okay. So well, maybe you, maybe you heard that listen. question ahead of time, but that's fine. No, actually, I mean, I probably I heard it, but that doesn't mean I was even thinking it through. So there you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well played. Very politician I'm just, answer. I'm just that good. That's I'm how you get to be one good. of the top women in media with the 2020 award that. You failed to humble brag at the top. Um, (laughs) So you started. um, You so I want to. I want to ask you about. Was there a time growing up where you didn't have the intuition, where you talked yourself out of things? You know, I think human nature is to talk ourselves out of things and not just have that faith that yeah we can we can do this and take that leap. Um, I look through. It's funny when I got into advertising and actually eventually, like I had a career in media before I found this firm and went through that process and, you know, worked at some of the largest firms in the nation on the media front. Um, But what's interesting is when I founded this firm, my mom sent me a, a snapshot. I have to find it somewhere, but she sent me a picture of a letter that I wrote to myself in fourth grade saying, I want to work in advertising, and this is why I want to work in advertising. Really? Which, how creepy is that? Like, that's kind of creepy, right? Like, that fourth grade Mary Ann was, I want to work in advertising. And I completely forgot about it. So that intuition and that instinct is in us if we just channel it. But as children, we're less afraid to say no. Like, we're just like, this is who I am. It's okay. I think children don't have that fear filter yet. We haven't been taught completely that you got to keep things at arm's length or push back or, you know, test everything out and be safe all the time. It's our job to test things when we're kids. And, you know, fast forward, now it's like, okay, I took that leap, but could I have taken it earlier? Are there other things that, you know, you go through it? You learn something every year in life, no matter how old you get. And, but that instinct and that intuition of young, um, listen to that earlier. And that's in you and that's in all of us, but it's human nature to want to push back. Yeah, I tell my kids all the time, if you run into an adult who says they know everything, they're lying they to know. your face. 100%. Like, I, I tell them, I'm like, I don't know. I say it all the time to my kids. I don't know. Like, why would I know that? Yeah, I, and I, I tell my kids, I don't know. Look it up. I don't know a lot of things. Let's look it up. Let's see if we can figure it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But also, um, I, I'll make mistakes a lot of the time. and. Even to what you're saying, the, the kind of the self-talk aspect of being an adult and being an entrepreneur, you know, we talk a lot, a, a theme on this show is um, entrepreneurship is isolating. It's very mm-hmm. lonely, oh, so is. especially yeah. in Alaska, where yeah. most of your workforce <laughs> is outside of the area. Well, I mean, I am on an airplane for probably half of the year, not here because of clients not being in Alaska, but at the same time, like... 
just entrepreneurship as a whole is so lonely at times because you you know everything and then you know your fears on top of that right and that's mm-hmm. just being honest as an entrepreneur you know all the behind the scenes you know everything that's going on in your company and you have to be honest with yourself of everything that's going on otherwise if you're pulling the wool over your eyes then you're not you're not doing your best due diligence in your company and as an entrepreneur um, but then we add fear to that and that self talk like you just said is so important of okay what are the next things that I can do. I've overcome this before, or I've done this before, or you go back and look at through the things that you have survived. And none of us know everything. Reach out to people. It's okay. I think right now in entrepreneurship, we are at this peak, amazing time of collaboration. Work with people. We have so many experts, and now we have so many ways to connect where we haven't had that in the past. And COVID changed that. COVID made it where it's way more acceptable for us to all reach out to each other and brainstorm and think things through and collaborate and partner together more finding good partners and finding good people to work with where your expertise may not be is exactly how entrepreneurs should be moving forward in today's world yeah uh know what you don't know is a big thing uh that's an that's an uh ego death mushroom trip you gotta figure out um the other thing i want to touch on you know I, we have all these methods of communication, yet we. I think we're we're atrophying. I think uh, uh, I think we're we're not. We have more ways and more access to communicate and get information, but I think we all suck at it as a as a whole. Yeah, just emoji everything. Well, that you don't know, you don't get it. <laughs> I've been trying to write a bit about what if you used emojis in real life? How creepy would that be? Hieroglyphics. Right. Uh, I'll come over for that booty call. Wink. Well, gun. Right. Wait. You know? yeah. And we're also like going totally back in history. Like you just said hieroglyphics. Like are right. we going back to cave writings? Is that what we're going right. back to? Well, I mean, that's how we're communicating. Emojis yeah. are the universal language. It is, I mean, it's the one that all most more, more people on earth understand uh, because it's just hieroglyph. It's like the tablet's the oldest and newest thing at the same time. Exactly. That's um, exactly. Or, you know, but I think... We're worse at, re- and this is someone who can't read out loud, reading comprehension, like reading, reading a, or writing a text with, you know, there's no nuance in it. I, I'm going backwards, and I, I'm, I find myself calling more people now. Yeah, there's no yes. nuance in a text. Or a te- what's the worst is like trying to text someone or email someone that it takes so much longer just to do it than if you just called them up. Yeah, yes. and you get that mode because we hide behind keyboards with a lot of yep. our work, well, right? I, I've actually said this often. Thing. I feel like we're ra- yeah, it's a control thing, and we're raising a completely passive aggressive generation. Mm, like, yeah, that they can't have a conversation. Yeah, and if you look at a lot of things that I teach on, also is the generational habits that we're seeing because the first time in American history we have five working generations. We've never had hmm. that before. And if you think about that and the, all the spending power and the media consumption and all the data that goes into that, but part of it is these habits that are very passive aggressive. We have taught kids um, and generations to not communicate and not how and how to not communicate. They they think it's okay, you know, just send a text for whatever. Um, we've heard horror stories of, and actually we had this where an employee's parent called us called in sick for them. Um, they had a cold. It wasn't like they were in the hospital. It wasn't anything. But their their parent called in sick for them as if they were going to school. Like, things like that. Uh, uh, yeah. I hate yeah. the term adulting, like, by the way. Cringeworthy moment, right? I hate when people brag sick. about adulting. Oh, God. And you're like, no, just fucking be an adult. You're like, right. get your shit adult. adulting. You what are you doing? Yeah. Do I, what are you doing it. in your other times? Like, I get what it is, I get what it is though. It, your pants? What are you doing the other times? It, it's, but I get what it is. I kind of, cause I all do the same in a different way. You want a gold star. You want like, you want a little recognition. You want the a scratch bot- on the head. Yeah. The bottom, the bottom parts of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, like, and I don't think a lot of people are getting those uh, because attention spans are fragmented partly because we're bad at communicating. Yeah. And well, the, the and likes part of that it. is, yeah. And going into COVID, we were already bad at communicating. But then what COVID actually did was take the human interaction portion out of it. And now and it forced us even more to be in that text mode or overconsumption of media as a whole. 
So overconsumption of communication, overconsumption of information. And if you look at media habits and what people, um, where we shifted and where we went to, like in a two-week period, we saw an evolution that should have taken 10 to 20 years happen in a two-week period. Like that's that's significant. Where we're we had evolving. older generations that were not using social media, that overnight they're going to be on social media. And think of that side of it. We went to this overconsumption. We see this in American history, and anytime there's anything catastrophic that takes place, people want to overconsume information. Overcorrect, right? To- like yeah. it's a lot of overcorrection. It seems like these exactly. days. Exactly. Exactly. The difference with COVID, we never came back down. Other catastrophic catastrophic events, we came back down because the event takes place. Then we come back down. Okay, I don't need to consume as much. I consume a few things. It changes some habits. COVID, I need to overconsume, and we've continued to overconsume. Got more shows and, to watch. Yes, well, there's more shows to watch. We're trying to escape more than we ever have before because of the tension and because it's been so long and there's so many things going on. But then we're also trying to feed ourselves with enough information um, to make sure that everything's safe. Our, we created habits because it took, it took so long. We actually created substantiated habits that took place. And those haven't changed. So we've had, we have a two to three year really experiment of what took place with the human brain of what we're consuming and how we're consuming it. First thing, like well, my my favorite part about COVID and kind of the white collar uh, work workspace was that they're like, oh, Zoom, we can yes. we can work remotely, and it's like, bitch, right. this has been around for I ten know. years. Like, what? This isn't yes. new. This came out at the same time as COVID. What the hell? <laughs> right. Holy it's cow. so true. Everybody thought it was new technology, and it's like we've been doing this yeah. for years. But it did. It allowed entrepreneurs. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Like I'll tell you, our sales have gone through the roof since COVID and even before COVID, we were already in a growth mode, but once COVID hit, nobody cares where you are. They don't even, it did help normalize it. Like people who normally wouldn't be willing to jump on a zoom call, you know, they're kind of forced to that, you know, that was a huge portion of it. I think is people are just, the very, very salty hair executives were were like zoom. This thing's amazing. It's like, we've had video chat for maybe 20 years. I don't know. But like, this is how we should have been doing a lot of things anyway. And, and again, back to the kind of the communication aspect of it, uh, a lot of people are trying to do these hybrid uh, workforces coming back into offices a little bit. And they don't, I don't, or even if they just go fully remote, I don't think anybody's very, like I think on a whole, a lot of people aren't very good at managing that, right. that remote yeah. workforce. How do you handle that? Yeah, so we make sure to have interaction with each other on a regular basis. So management will come together and we're spread all out, but we will come together once a month. And then we uh, typically we make sweet. sure we have at least, yeah, we make sure that we have an in-person meeting management-wise once a quarter at minimum. Typically, we actually try to do a little bit more than that, but that's at minimum. And then we come together in a setting of that once a month for sure of making sure that we are communicating regularly. And then we have little meetings here or there for working on big projects, making sure. So that's on the management level. But then what's important is a lot of people, they started to lose culture of the company when they went remote or when they went to completely video. Um, that became early on when we saw, okay, this isn't really going to slow down. This isn't a two week experiment. And then we all come back into the office. And frankly, it opened up a lot more opportunities of workforce and where we were able to go and being able to think, okay, we don't all have to be in the same building, but you have to be intentional. That's probably the key thing is being intentional on culture, but the intentional on work product. What does this look like? How do we collaborate together intentionally via Zoom, via Teams, via whatever product you're using on it, but making sure that you're intentional in that. The reg- Here's the one thing that I, I see more and more um, with brands and with agencies and with everybody across the whole and marketers and entrepreneurs is death by meeting. We all of a sudden thought Ugh. that we needed to have more meetings Ugh. because, oh, we're all working remotely. Let's have five meetings a day to check in. We're going to do a morning check-in, a noon check-in, and an evening check-in. We didn't do that in the office. Why do we need to do that? We don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. And then you work, and do working meetings. Let's do stuff that we could have done alone on, on our own time. And, yeah. and instead, have, we'll include all these people into our suffering. 
and make them go through it with us. And I'm or you have really so much work. You have to work during the meeting, which defeats the purpose of being in the meeting most sure. of the time. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, I'll listen like a podcast, I guess, while I'm trying to do some of this yeah. things that are kind of brain dead. But it, uh, I read a thing from like a, a VC firm. And I wanted to make a, a table like that for us. It looks like a guitar pick because they said any meeting that has more than seven people is worthless. And I, yeah. I totally yeah. agree with that. And seven people is a lot. And I it's feel like, like a show. Um, and then, uh, you know, I feel like it sounds like you're very, it sounds like you're intentional and thoughtful proactively. And I think you might have been dancing around being proactive in your work than letting it just come to you and going, oh, shit, I got to get this done. Yeah, and you have to be, right? You have to show that proactive. And as leaders and entrepreneurs, of, it doesn't matter if you have, if it's just you or if you have 40, 50, 100 employees. It doesn't matter on that front. You have to be intentional and you have to be proactive. You have to have that self-discipline. And I think entrepreneurs as a whole, we're driven people. We are people that naturally have this instinct to be driven, um, we have a tendency to be, a lot of us are accidental entrepreneurs, but we have that spirit within us, right? And we land into it. Me, I don't think I was an accidental entrepreneur. I kind of, I kind of landed it, but not really. It was like, okay, no, I'm going to take this faith and do it. You knew so at you 10, have, but you so didn't know it until later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you, you, you got, to. you got some vim and vigor in you. It's You're pretty crazy. You've got some, yeah, we can what tell 10 you What 10 year old some, wants to be in advertising. I know what, right, what, right? what ads were you seeing that you're like, hell yeah. Yeah. You know, I really to know, like my mom said that I used to rewrite jingles all the time. Like I would <laughs> watch a TV. I don't remember doing this. But I would rewrite and mom. I, I can I can Google figure out the bagel bites theme. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. No. Go ahead. No, She's I was gonna, gonna do say, a jingle. Just <laughs> what do you got? You you have anything off the top of your head? I knew you were gonna call me out on that. I'm trying to think of anything I would do. Like I remember oh I By can't Menon? I'm weird. trying to remember which jingle. No, 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 yes, uh-uh. it was. No, you didn't. I, why would I say that? We are a heterosexual gay couple. Yeah, we are. Um, I got the willies. <laughs> By Oof. minute. Because it sh- it's the shortest one you can't really <laughs> yeah. do anything with. Yeah. But that's like what an audio logo. Ooh. That's not really a jingle. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, I remember trying to re- make, like, reword them so that they would actually be funny as opposed to just whatever it was. Um, yeah, I'm trying Perry. to remember. I remember one with my Lanta, but I don't remember which mm-hmm. jingle I did something with. I don't remember. Anything. Oh, that's going to bother me now. I don't now. know why my Lanta comes to. You're going to. My gonna, Lanta. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Ricola. That's the other one that was in my head. My oh, Lanta. <laughs> that's it. Um, you're going to love the Weird Al movie on uh, Roku, by the way, if, if you're writing oh? jingles, parody jingles. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, it's the uh, best movie of 2022. I'm saying. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, suck on that, Top Gun. Um, Two. Yeah, and uh, Elvis in Fruity Elvis movie <laughs> that I can't I can't get into every time I put it on. Um, I go to watch it, and I can't finish it. Like, I go to watch it, and the first five, I'm like... My mom's okay. like, you got to go see it in the theater. I'm like, it's not going to... Unless I own a theater... I'm go I see Black Panther in the theater. Think I'm going to see that? Um, I, I do. Wakanda forever. You know how I am. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so... I want to get back to this generational marketing aspect. Um, you know, how do you, what do you use to kind of, for your research? Are you, um, I, I, th- I kind of start thinking lately, I, I've really thought about marketing and me- media buying is part of that process, you know, on a strategic level as um, the scientific method, right? Yeah. We think or the client thinks they know who their audience is, right? So I like to ask up front in the discovery kind of call or you know intro meeting and go, who, who, who's your target audiences? And then they tell me and I go, now how do you know that? And they just go, I know, right? And it's like, did you just know? Or are you, are you going off of like data that you read from your CRM or something? And they're like, mm-hmm. nah. And I go, okay, I'm gonna challenge that. That's the hypothesis. Uh, scientific method, let's see if we can break it, right? So let's see if we can break that idea. And not to be a contrarian, but just to go, I've, and, but part of it's kind of um, uh, a hypocrite because I'm, I'm using my intuition to go, I don't, I don't think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you know. My bullshit is well, better than your bullshit. Brand, 
the majority of brands are just guessing. They don't necessarily know. And what is the substantiated data that's backing that up? You don't know. And they're guessing. And they're saying, oh, this is what I think. And I think at the older the brand, the harder it is for them to really figure that out and really dig into it deeper. But in today's world, and you guys know this. I was going to say, I don't know. I mean, the, more, the further it gets along, the more they, the more data they get from you, you know. there's They should. But that data tells a story, right? Right. And if not using that story and using that information to really dig in, you have to get your to know your audience far further than you ever have before. It's no longer a demo that we're targeting. Like when I started in media, it was what's your target demographic? Right. Okay. We're talking adults 25 to 54. Okay. Like that's why, why that yeah, why was uh, advertising on TV always like we got to I get the legacy brands like Pepsi when it started on they want to get you, advertising. They want to get you 13 to 24 and you're like they got no money. I I right. want to I want to I want to work with clients and businesses that are targeting old people because the one predictor of, uh, of wealth is age. Um, that's, that's, I mean, I get it. Well, you're Mountain Dew. Baby yeah. But you're, ba- you're dismissing baby boomers who still have the most money expendable cash. They have $70 trillion as a generation. Like why, why have we moved on from them? Mm-hmm. They still have the most. Our so <laughs> we right. They still have the most. Yeah. Right? Gen Xers, Gen Xers and millennials, like they, Think of this statistic. Gen Xers have 2.4 trillion and millennials have 2.5 trillion. Okay? Oh, oh our, our friend of the Suck it, Gen X. Yeah. yeah. You know? Like, Gen Xers are right there in that middle. They're, I always say they're the forgotten generation because they have to it, fight for every scrap. They except get. they tell everybody that they're the forgotten generation, so they're not. We didn't forget. <laughs> yeah. And we remembered you saying that yesterday. Our friend of the program, uh, Dean Akers, likes to <laughs> tell us Gen X is the worst generation because they don't have kids. Uh, they're, they're not as entrepreneurial. Have you, have you heard him talk about that? Did you say based on what, Dean? Oh, no. He pulls like, he'll pull like uh, census data. He'll pull like macro data. Were you data. like, okay, fine. No, he, like, I, again, one of those things were self-talk. I would be mm-hmm. like, he's not fucking right. And then everything I challenge him on. I assume everything I, Dean says is right. I don't. Well, now I do because he's been right about so many things that I'm like, I don't know about that. No. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, what's it called? He's our former boss. Uh, okay. I consider him a mentor um, And uh, uh, nowadays. And everything he's telling us, he's just trying to, he's seven years old trying to impart his wisdom on us. He's, he has wisdom to listen to. Yeah, absolutely. But, but the I, thing that I so got to give her knee jerk reaction of going, nah. Yeah. Well, but that, and what's fascinating is those that are in their seventies and even in the high end of their seventies are still working or mentoring or helping. Like that's different than past generations where they don't, my father who's 70, he just turned 78 he retired two years ago, and then the next week he tells me, yeah, I took on a retirement project. It's the same type of job <laughs> that he's had for 55 years, but now, oh, I took on a retirement project. I've been trying okay, to... It's not a retirement project. That's a job. I've been yeah. trying to get my dad to do some... He was an attorney, uh, commercial real estate attorney for like 40 years. Oh, you should get arrested. Years. Well, yeah. he, doesn't, he doesn't do that. Otherwise, it'd be awesome. I'd just be dealing drugs. Uh, but he... Uh, I'm like... I keep going to my mom. I'm like... Can we find him to like volunteer somewhere to help out with something? And she's yeah. like, she had to like finally break it down. She's like, stop trying to pitch this because she's like, your generation is a lot different. He did the gold watch generation. You work yes. at one place. Right. He's done. As long For the as rest you can. Of your life. He's he over. A secretary that did all that other stuff we have to do on our own as entrepreneurs in the beginning, where you have to do all this admin and clerical and figure it out and all that stuff. And he was he just. He also went to law school and played in the NFL, so he gets a secretary. Yeah, and I don't even know if he wanted to do wants to do anything like that. I'm just like I to me. I feel like the guys that I just want him to selfishly live longer. I feel like the guys that are working or doing something like that, yep. they're they're more fulfilled on a day to day basis. But okay. I think they like annoying my parents like annoying each other all, all day. I think that's the well, new yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's their job. Yeah, that's their job. They go watch uh, my niece's volleyball. Your mom's stuff. like, well, then what will I do then? <laughs> yeah. I, she's got a tow. She's got to drive him around like Uber now. It's fun. See, I mean, that's a cool thing. It is funny. Okay, because she's like, <laughs> if you say so. Well, he's like, yeah, come pick me up from the golf course. I'm 18 Heinekens in. Oh, sweet. Here's the thing, though, too. Like, they're still active. They're still doing things. Like, generationally, they're still doing things. 
even if they retire, they're still doing things. And that's where people are living longer. We see this, like when it comes to your media planning and your marketing planning, I like how you said, you know, as I look at marketing and media is part of that, my media planning is part of that. Because marketing is this gigantic umbrella Mm -hmm. or bridge, right? And your media plan is a pillar of that bridge, holding that bridge up. And until like you're figuring that out, as we're looking at media plans and how we're reaching that target demographic, persona, I like to say persona as opposed to demographic, because that's who we are. That's our customer. That's that individual. If they're on the golf course, if they have expendable cash, like who are they? Where are they? What are they doing? We can target like this is this is a dream. If you would have told me 20 plus years ago when I started my career that I can target ads like this, it's incredible. And you just have to not be afraid to look at it that way. And brands really need to just embrace this because the data is there more now and it tells us a story. Yeah. And I thought you were going to say persona uh, for those reasons, but also you can meet them at the point where they need the product or service, right? 100%. 100%. You're trying to figure yeah. out behavioral trends in yeah. that kind of uh, psychology. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a vibe. You're very much into psychology, very much uh, uh, anal- self uh, analytical, which I, uh, was something I wanted to touch on earlier because I think we talk about entrepreneurs, they don't take the 10 minutes a day without the phone because you get in this busy hustle culture bullshit and yep. you never really analyze what you're doing you know, on a daily basis or even a weekly basis a lot of the time. You're just kind of constantly moving forward, you think, and it's you're really like quicksand. Yeah. Yep. You're, in a ha- you're a hamster in a wheel. What I find with myself is when I actually stop thinking anything future. Most entrepreneurs, we're visionaries. We are. We're not going to be the people that are the tactical, necessarily the doers. We can be, but we're visionary. And what I find is kind of a red flag for me is if I'm not thinking past a year or I'm not thinking past a certain, I need to slow it down. I need to take my time and be intentional with that 10 minutes a day of focus of, okay, what is what is it that I'm looking at? I got to get my brain into that recoup. And actually, I think a lot of entrepreneurs fell into this with COVID because things were just moving in a weird way and fast that our brains never really got to recoup and they never got to regenerate anything that were those entrepreneurial thoughts of what's next, what's next, what's next, because that's how we think. That's how entrepreneurs are wired. And, but you have to be intentional about it. Otherwise, you will become that hamster on the wheel of I'm just busy. Well, busy isn't necessarily productive. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, you're not producing anything when you're right. planning in the future. You yeah. Start yep. producing, write it down, put it, you know, busy, yep. busy feels productive. Up. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Look what I made. And then it's you get a computer though. And then you get you like to get a productivity boner out of like telling people how much stuff you've done. Right. Well, <laughs> how many it's lines like of code we, that was, bro? Well, we, <laughs> and we no feel like it's those affirmations of adulting, right? Of I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. Oh, I'm everybody's busy. always busy. The people who tell we're on the, on in general, the people who tell me that they're busy the most are I know they're not. Like I know right. they're not. I know. Ask them. Oh yeah, what are you? What, no, what are you I busy do. With? I, that's why they don't want to hang out. <laughs> right. <laughs> because I'm like, what? Her what's, friend list what's is that, dwindling. What's that? What's that schedule look like? I want to ask you actually. If we're anything on this show, on the, on the entrepreneurship side, we try to have some pragmatic advice, some real, real talk. And, um, you know, what LinkedIn, the, link, the LinkedIn feed is nice at, at like, motivational things, and, but it, I don't think it really helps anybody. It's like chicks on Instagram posting uh, quotes. <laughs> like, have you seen that yeah, in stories? Yeah. Right. Uh, every, every chick, and you're like, oh, man, just... Can we talk? Not Do you, need you help? said it that way. Um, but uh, what is your routine? We, uh, Eric and I are big What time in that. are you waking up? Yeah, what, what's your you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner with work? Yeah. You know, give us the whole work-life balance. And is it different in Alaska? Well, so Dark. a lot of our clients are on the East Coast, so it is a little different. But when I, I am big on routine, and I am almost religious on routine. That's good. Okay, so... I am very like strict, like this is going to happen. This is the way it is. Um, so my day starts at 4 a.m. Hey. Every day. You and Eric. Yeah. yeah. And Jocko Wilnick. That is the, that's the way it starts. I usually start with some reflection time. Usually the first 10 minutes of my day is some reflection. Get kind of like just kind of what's going on in the day. Just look at things. The night before I go to bed, um, I always check my calendar. So I already have, I know what the day looks like ahead of time. But 4 a.m. start. I work out, 
I usually do my walk strength training. That's what I typically do. I get it out of the way. Then by five thirty, the same shit. Yeah. Ready for- did you read Eric's so, feelings journal? You read my book. No. Oh, okay. See, I think the most disciplined people just get it done. Just like get your stuff done that you need to get done. Yeah. Well, um, Eric pitched it like to me as no one takes your mornings away. And when you yeah. wake up that early and it took me a while to actually try it oh, out sure. and I got more stuff done and yeah, go ahead. Sorry. It's amazing what you can get done between four to 8 a.m. Yes. And how productive spent. you can be. 8 a.m. rolls yeah. around. I'm done. At 8 a.m., like, because you can be so productive in those four hours. I get my workout done. I start, and I probably around, like, by the time I get ready, I get ready, like, around 5.30 to, if I need to be on Zoom or if I need to be on anything. And then from there, it is a very productive day. Like, right now, you know, our meeting started at 2 o'clock Alaska time. Usually my day's wrapped up by now because of the fact that I'm so productive in the morning. Um, and by wrapped up, it means I can get whatever the other things that are going on in my life, personal, all the above. Um, and it makes for that intentional time with my family. So I can make sure that I have that balance there. So um, by 7 o'clock, I am ready to go. And everything is like that's when my first meetings usually start. Sometimes my first meeting, I allow for a window. I'm big on blocking my calendar. So I allow for a window of 6 a.m., forward of meetings because that helps for east coast that helps west coast it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you're international we can all have that done um and if there's any calls that have to happen that early in the morning i'm already scheduled for a 4 a.m start so i'm usually having breakfast uh, when everybody you know i'm having lunch when everybody else is having breakfast it's usually that's not an uncommon thing and i'm usually in bed every night by 8 8 30 yeah so, that I yeah, know that game. Hanging out with you, if if it hits Apparently. nine, you're I you're stay up a little later than that. like ten. But if right. one, uh, you oh, it's I like can. Cinderella. I, I turn into a pumpkin. If right. It is oh, 10 whoa, o'clock, weird. Yeah. yeah, I'm a pumpkin at ten o'clock. Well, I feel I like um, I I do it if I get out of my routine like I had lately. I I punish myself by waking up at four until I don't have yeah. to anymore. Only because I can't keep I can't sustain that early because I'll do stand up shows. But um, but at the same time, I use it as a punishment to get my, my S together. Um, Just to get, get it together. And so I have, like, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, like, I have those block days that I do it. I actually even have volunteer time that I schedule in there that I'm going to be helping in the community or whatever it is. It's always in the afternoon. Um, and Wednesdays, that is my, I call it GSD, get my stuff done day. And I just, that's my day that I'm doing, I'm, you know, being the CEO of our company, making sure that certain things are happening and making sure that I'm looking at all the financials, making sure everything's, you know, what are we doing for business development? How are sales? How are things going? How are, you know, things moving? Um, Make sure I meet with the trainer twice a week. I have those every Tuesday, Thursday at the same exact time. So if you, if you build a routine as an entrepreneur, you will be more successful. A routine is something that actually, it helps you so much more in staying on track and being intentional with every minute that you have, because you have to be intentional with every minute you have. And people listening to that, they feel that would restrict them. And I'll tell you, I was the same way. Like, I was like, I'm a creative guy. I'm a vision, you know, I'm a vision guy. You know, I get, I hustle pretty hard, but like, at the same time, that feels constraint. That feels like handcuffed. It gives you direction. But it actually, what it does is, it's that discipline's ultimate freedom kind of thing. What it does is it, 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 it frees you up to be, a, you become efficient with your time. You value time a lot more too, because uh, it is a commodity when you're an agency owner, for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's that thing of like, you know, it, it will allow your brain to breathe to be more creative. So anybody listening that's going, fuck that, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be in a military kind of thing. And it's like, no, no, no. By being disciplined with those habits, You'll actually be better at. It frees any- your brain up for other stuff. Right, creative like you don't have to worry It really about your, does your because day. you don't. You don't have to think about it. My routine is routine and habit now. I don't have to think about it. I know what you know what my day looks like always, and it. Th- there's no question about what time I wake up and, and productive. Yeah, there's no question. Um, I know every day starts at four a.m. Well, you're one of the best guests we've had on the show, and uh, we'll end it by our producer is holding up a picture of Sarah Palin. Uh, oh. How many times do you get that? That with the Alaska 
Brown hair and glasses. Brown hair and kind glasses. Of. That's everything well, you need. I've never been. I've never been compared to Sarah Palin, but um, we disagree. I get asked all the time. <laughs> I've asked all. I get asked all the time about her or whatever. A lot of people think about Sarah Palin, and so. I didn't know. And she stand for Congress, so we'll see. She's um. She. We'll see. We're not sure what's going to happen. The election results have not officially come in, and they won't before Thanksgiving. So we'll find out. And I didn't know the. Those. I can see Russia from here. Was a Mandela was it effect. It was Tina gonna, Fey it, saying it on it SNL. Was Tina Fey, and you cannot like a hundred percent. It was weird? not Sarah Palin that said it. It was a hundred percent Tina Fey. Yep. Berenstein Bears. Um, Berenstein Bears. No, don't. Mandela effect. Yeah, it's no. weird. It's just weird how we all kind of get yeah. the bias. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for coming on. We appreciate yeah. it, um, and we'll we'll have to have you back on at some point. Oh, I love it. I had a fun time. It was good. All right. See ya. Thank you, Thank you guys.